little bit different and I've never done a live stream before. I think I did a few tests, but uh, never an official live stream. So this will be the official first live stream. So just bear with me as I'm not used to doing this yet. And I hope to do more obviously in the future. So what I have tonight isn't an extremely rare, but what I would classify as at least a somewhat rare book called The British Eda by L.A. Waddell. And this particular edition was published in 1930 by Christian Book Club of Hawthorne, California. So this book was my father's, my late father, and he left behind a collection of a lot of interesting books that luckily I have in my possession now. So a lot of the live streams are gonna be book dives and I'm not gonna read the whole book in its entirety because, hello Prometheus Peanut, thanks for joining. I'm not gonna read the book in its entirety because it would take far too long, especially for a live stream. But possibly if there's interest, I may read the whole book and then upload it as a series of videos, part one, part two, part three, etc. Um, something like that, kind of like an ASMR book reading type of thing. But that that would be in the future. For now, we're just gonna kind of just do a little deep dive in this book. And um, we'll just see how that goes. We'll see how people like that. Um, the reason that I chose this book is because um, it's, it's an epic poem, but it's a historical kind of thing. And it has references not only to the Bible and the Christian gods, but also to the Sumerian and the Babylonian. And it has a lot of illustrations and it just has a lot of information. You can obviously later take screenshots pause, whatever. I'm going to try to go through it more in an explanation sense rather than a literal sense of reading it. But what I find what I find the most interesting about it is that is that it has a lot of um, information about the similarities between the Norse gods and the biblical deities or biblical figures like Thor, Adam, Jesus Christ, Isis, Osiris, stuff like that. And so I could just kind of, I'm kind of waiting for more people to join before I start showing some of these pictures. But the interesting thing is, is in my opinion, is that, um, Hold on a second. Somebody told me that the book's sideways. Um, hmm. Okay, so maybe I should change the orientation. I wanted to do it, so I guess it should be like this then, huh? Well, that kind of screws it up. Um, Cause I wanted it to be widescreen. So hold on, before we get any further, try to figure out what the right orientation is. Yeah, I know I could turn the camera, but then it's gonna be like, then it's gonna be like there's black bars on the side. I wanted it to be Oh, okay. Different from phone to your PC. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see. Whatever. So I could do it like that. That's better. All right, well. All right, let's just do it like that then. Fuck it. Um, pardon my French. Um, so yes, yeah, so as I was saying... The, the most interesting thing about this book, in my opinion, is how 
it talks about the history of the Babylonian gods and the Sumerian gods being essentially the same as the Christian gods. And I mean that in the sense that it actually gives more validity to the Christian deities. See, the, the, the problem with a lot of pagans, especially these neo-pagans, which are essentially just, you know, atheists kind of LARPing as theists, is that they, um, is that they try to make it like their gods came from Northern Europe. But what this book actually tries to explain is that the Sumerian gods and the Babylonian gods, the gods of essentially North Africa or the Middle East, Western Asia, is that they were the ones who brought their gods to Europe. In other words, as deities go through changes, then they're brought into other cultures and other parts of the world. Yeah, they change names and they may change shape and form or even practice, but what they fail to understand is the deep history within that. And, that, and I mean that in the sense that what you have is you have a situation where, say, like you have Thor, everybody knows Thor as like a Norse god, but what this book postulates is that Thor is actually a representation of Dan or Than or Tan or Tanin, and the solar father god Atom or Osiris, you see? So that's just one example. And then we have Woden. Now everybody knows Woden, like Odin or Vatan, or there's other, there's other spellings and pronunciations. And there's even other examples of, of Odin being uh, Roman Mercury or Mars. Well, I guess in, in Greek, he would be, in, in Greek, he'd be uh, Hermes, you know, the god of uh, cargo. And then he's also the god of messenger, so that would be Mercury. So that'd be Roman Mercury, and then Greek would be Hermes. So here we have Woden or Sadar as the malignant Saturn whose sacred day of Sabbath was Saturday. In the Mithra cult, the statue of Osta, 190 AD. See, so that's an older representation of Woden, or it became Odin. And that's what I was saying about the pagans and the neo-pagans, is that they have this idea that their pagan Norse gods were original to Scandinavia. But once again, and this book has many examples of him being represented in ancient Babylonia. This is obviously pre-Christian. And then we have an example of Odin being like Jehovah. Obviously Jehovah predating uh, the Norse Odin, you know. Um, and then we also see that those gods probably did come from the Indo-Europeans of the, um, what we would consider now essentially India or you know, Northern India, like Tibet area as well, where the, the, the first Indo-Europeans came from, um, bringing uh, one of the first languages, Sanskrit. So someone just said, Happy lady just said, so if the Roman gods and the Christian God is the same, why did Romans crucify Jesus? That book is a lie. Yeah, no, that's not, um, that's not what it's saying. Exactly. That's not, that's not what I, that's not even what I'm trying to say. The Romans, uh, and another group of people killed Jesus because of a misunderstanding, kind of a miscarriage of justice. If you remember correctly, there was a man named Barabbas 
and Barabbas was a rapist, and Barabbas and Jesus Christ were both on trial. And back then in Roman law, they would ask the public to set someone free. And so it was between Jesus Christ and Barabbas. And because the people were angry at Jesus because of what he was saying was so radical and controversial at the time, a lot of people actually wanted Barabbas to be set free. So they say free Barabbas, free Barabbas. And that's actually free Barabbas is actually kind of a kind of a meme or a catchphrase, sort of, if you know what it means. And it means free Barabbas, free the rapist Barabbas instead of Jesus Christ. Yeah. OK, yeah, you know the story. Well, if you know the story, then you know why they did it. And this book isn't saying that Jesus Christ is the same as Christ. what I'm saying is, is that this book shows that the Norse gods are not original to Scandinavia. No, that's not, I'm, I didn't say that they were all the same. I said that gods lower, deities lower than Jesus Christ were imported. This isn't saying that those gods are equal to Jesus Christ. I'm not even, um, I'm not here to argue. I'm here to just explain what's in the book. It's a historical. And the other thing, I don't know if you, if you caught this or not in the beginning, but this book was put out by a Christian book club of Hawthorne, California. So obviously some Christians have no problem with it. So I'm just going to take that as kind of a, as an approval that it's not blasphemous or heresy or sacrilege. This is, this is a historical record. And it actually gives validity to Christianity because it shows that Christianity actually spread in a way by these lesser religions, these lower, these newer religions actually copying history from, from Babylonia and Samaria. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know or didn't catch the video, this is the name of the book. And it's also in the title description of the video. Um, this book is still available. You can find it on eBay um, or booksellers online. Um, not terribly expensive, depending on the edition. And there's obviously there's PDFs of it and so forth available online. But yeah, one of the things that this book um, talks about, see, is you see here. So you have Thor or Sig's tree guarded by goats, Goths, as in like the Vistagoths, attacked by. Shaldi, adversary from Babylonian seal afterward. Note raid sun on each side of tree which stands on mountain and crescent moon over the assailant. And then here we have Thor or Yig's tree attacked by Shaldi wolf from archaic Hittite seal. Note tree as raid pedestal cross with birds, geese under right handed goat or heart and the assailant, wolf, bull, scorpion, etc. of hell cult. So what you have is you have an example of these deities changing names as they go throughout cultures. Okay. And when they try to explain this to the Scandinavians, they have to use their gods to explain these old stories. So it's not it's not blaspheming Christianity at all. What it's, what, it, what it's doing is it's explaining how when these stories were carried through different civilizations and different cultures, they changed the names so that the people would understand who they were talking about. And then here we have another example. We have Eve or Gunnever as Gunhilda or Gun, the Warus, meeting King Thor or Adam from Sumerian seal, 2500 BC. Note she, has an, she is armed as a Valkor, as an Amazonian rides or steps on her lion. Totem carries in right hand her serpent Cadius, whilst King Thor carries his club or hammer, she laterally has defied in his aspect as Athene, Sumerian, Anatul. The similar inscription reads, Lord, 
Ladai or Lady Gunai, wherein Latau equals Thor's edict, title, or Edel, the Anglo Saxon Atheel, as Gun and the Sumerian source of Gun of the Eda. And then you see the Sumerian cuneiform text here telling the story. And the cuneiform, the Sumerian cuneiform is kind of like the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics where you could have a lot of information and just these kind of little symbols, these little cuneiform. It's one of the oldest written languages. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, kind of a general outline of, of how they were able to translate in a way culturally. But what I think is the most interesting part is how what we perceive to be old as new again and all that kind of stuff is it's actually going back to biblical times. In other words, we can trace the origins of all religions, uh, especially the Abrahamic religions, obviously to that area of the world, what we now refer to as the, the Middle East. And we see that even the European pagan deities have roots in the Middle East. In other words, these, these types of things didn't just spring out of nowhere. They didn't just spring out of, out of Scandinavian soil. They actually came from, from Sumeria, ancient Babylon, things like that. Okay, so now over here we have a depiction of the marriage of King Adam Thor and Eve with wedding procession from rock sculptures at Asatai near Petra of about 3000 BC. Note Adam in Gothic garb carrying his mace on shoulder high by his men attended by his royal unicorn goat meets Eve, who is also given, who is also given the unicorn as the bethrottled queen, and Eve, who is also given, or sorry, I'm reading the same line again, it's given the, uh, the bethrottled queen, and both bear an apple-like symbol. Eve is followed by the Edenite, Balder, or Abel. So you have, to, that's the other thing, Balder being Thor's brother, or Abel being Cain's, you know, Cain being, you know, the first, the one who slew Abel. Both mounted on cat-like lions or leopards, Loki, uh, Baal, a bull, or Balder bears a double axe, which in Samaria is Baal, with the definition, the hostile lord of Loach. For example, Loki, behind him are the Eden Veards, mounted on two-headed vulture, the reunite Adam, or Herr Thor carved like himself, nearly life-size on the side of the rock sanctuary are here omitted for want of space. Okay, so there's actually, what they're saying is there's more to this, there's more to this um, depiction that's carved here, but it's, it's, it won't fit on the page, so they cut it out of the book. But see, when we talk about the old world and old world civilizations and things like that. Um, this is essentially the kind of culture, the kind of things that we're talking about. That's, so that's why I thought that it was relevant to the channel. And I can see how some people might not, if they have a certain type of faith, they might not want to entertain these things. But, you know, that's the thing is we have to be open-minded. We can't just dismiss things simply because they don't fit a fundamentalist or a very personalized a, um, you know, uh, interpretation of faith or interpretation of Christianity for that matter. You know, we have to be open to all historical records when we're researching the past. I know that some of these things don't quite line up with, you know, say certain denominations of Christianity or things like that, but we have to have strong faith. In other words, if you can't entertain the idea of how different cultures interpreted myths and things like that, then your faith isn't really that strong because this isn't, um, this isn't an attack on faith at all. Actually, 
that's the funny thing about this book. And like I stated and proved earlier, it being published by a Christian book club in 1930, is that it, um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't denounce anything. All it is, is it's a, it's a historical record of how the Sumerians, um, stories were passed on through the ages. And how there was this kind of familiarity, I guess you could say. And this is a very, very old account of that. Like I said, this is just a 1930s, uh, 1930 edition of the book. But what the book holds is a lot of information and a lot of depictions about how these gods went through. See, so here we have Eve or Aidan, Sumerian, Adonai or Atunai as Athen Greek art from vase painting of 5th century BC. Okay, and then you can find a translated PDF. Yeah, you can find a translated PDF. It's not that hard. They're out there. Like I said, it's not a terribly rare book per se. I just think that this um, edition being uh, printed in 1930 um, it might be a little bit more difficult to find that. That's why I chose to read this book, um, also because it's from 1930, and that's kind of, uh, I wouldn't say it's a cutoff necessarily, but it's definitely getting up there. I mean, it's almost 100 years old. So who knows if newer editions have exactly the same all right, the same uh, information. Because that's the thing about newer editions of books is you always run the risk of it being slightly different than the first edition. But in some cases, second editions are, are better because they've had uh, updates that actually improve the information rather than take away from it. Okay, so... In certain situations, newer editions of books can actually be an improvement. So I'm just trying to read the chat and also read the book here. So there isn't a, a whole lot of depictions of buildings. Unfortunately, that would be kind of a bonus, but there is some illustrations here, like we have uh, Levis or Helse or Avis Castle, the seaport of Cilicia from Sir Henry Ewell's Marco Polo. So we do have some engravings here. Of some old structures. And then here we have Adam Zig Zax or Zeus attacked by Typho, Tyvo or Abel, Seth. From Alta Frias of Pergamon. Note Thor or Zig with the bolt or hammer, attended by his eagle or sunhawk, overthrowing Tivo, Balder, Abel, whose legs end in two serpents and who's having a or heaving a huge stone and left hand border, young Cain under his shield, watching the contest as described in the Eda. So why that's why that's important is because in in Norse mythology, we have a story of how Loki tricked um, Baldur, or no, he he tricked somebody else to kill Baldur, 
And why that's similar is because they're brothers, and then there's the similarity, obviously, to Cain and Abel. Cain being the one who slew Abel. So that's what I'm saying, is that, that they're, they're, they're retelling stories from the Old Testament to the pagans after. See, the thing that you have to remember is that this was written after Christ. In other words, this was written in the Viking Age. This was for people of Scandinavian descent to interpret the, um, how would you say, the, the stories. You know, I'm trying to read the chat here. Uh, let's see, JG said something. The Bible has been supernaturally changed. I have family Bibles from the early 1900 era with anachronism throughout, sorry, cut off. Throughout, I read the Bible two times before this took place. Yeah, I don't doubt that. All kinds of different versions. And as far as it being supernaturally changed, I can't dismiss that. Um, I, I try to keep an open mind about that, so. And then Miss Honeybee says, yes, it has been used to say the lion will lay with the lamb, and now it says the lion will lay with the wolf. Yeah, well, that's um, that's a good example. Um, while we're on that subject, actually, uh, there's a good example in the book of Enoch, which some people say is actually the, the original book of Genesis, when it talks about Enoch's travels to the top of the earth, to the land where no flesh walks. But then in Matthew, it's changed to the land where flesh does walk. So that's, a, that's an interesting, I would say more than just a mistranslation or a different translation. I mean, it changes the literal meaning of the verse. And if you don't believe me, you can look into that. You can cross-reference that with the uh, King James Version rather than the, uh, the traditional Old Testament. Or if you can find you know, the, the book of Enoch, which should have been in the Old Testament, if you ask me. I don't know why exactly it was omitted from the King James Version and other versions, but you know, that's, that's a whole other subject, technically, so we're not gonna get into that right now. Um, but yeah, I just, I wanted to talk about this book because I felt that a lot of my subscribers would find it interesting if they didn't know about it already. And then we also see even an Asian influence here where we have Typho or Abel, Baldur's Fiery Dragon Wheel of Eden in Chinese art. See, so there's a representation of that, of um, another, another uh, example of two worlds colliding, so to speak, and then um, their myths being traded around. And um, I don't think that this is new to, to everybody. A lot of people are aware of this phenomenon of how ancient religions got transmuted and passed down to other cultures but not everybody knows that and uh, some people are just getting into this kind of research so obviously this would be a really good book if you're just getting into that kind of research um, and I can't go over everything in this live stream but like I said I just wanted to kind of give a general outline of what the book is about and then if anybody wants to pursue it further so here we have Adam Thor or Anandvari as Anadara, fishman of the waters from Assyrian Babylonian. So that's interesting because who else is sometimes represented as a fish? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is known as the fish. Um, and that has a lot to do with the age of Pisces you know, Jesus being of the age of Pisces. And then we can look at it as how the Scandinavians were converted around 990 AD, 1000 AD, um, 1000 AD being the first Christian Viking king, King Olaf, um, is that they were trying to explain to these people like Jesus Christ was like Thor. He was like the sun of Odin, Odin being like Jehovah. So that's that was really easy for the Scandinavians to convert when they were when they were when it was explained to them in that way. But 
once again, what this book kind of reinforces is that the idea that is that the very first religions of the world, that the true religions are always going to be traced back to the Middle East. It doesn't matter how they were imported and exported around the, around the, um, I don't know what you would call it, civilizations, I guess, around the realm. Okay. But a lot of people see this kind of stuff and they see it as satanic or they see it as blasphemous. But it's not. It's actually, it's just historical records. And um, what, it, what it does is it paints a, a clearer picture to how different cultures were, were taught basically the same story. And it was just a way to get them to actually, I wouldn't say completely disavow, but at least meld the two different religions, their pagan totem gods with a more Abrahamic um, interpretation. And then that eventually led to the complete um, conversion of Europe, which was a good thing because it ended the tribal uh, infighting that was never going to end between the different pagan tribes. Uh, once you started having a unification through Christianity, uh, it, it brought a lot of peace to Europe, or what we, what we call Europe now. And, and that goes for other parts of the realm as well. Okay, so here's another uh, good example is um, Loki or Balder, the wolf tribe chief as the green man at door of the banqueting hall of Adam Thor, Aji's Hall, um, altercating with the cook from Hittite Seal, 2200 BC. Note Loki is given the wolf's head and a Gothic attendant stands beside the cook threatening, threatening, threateningly with a whip. Miss Honeybee says, 1942, hold on a second. Miss Honeybee said, 1942, 1492, timeline changed, 1776, timeline rip. Yeah, I definitely think that we go through uh, different ages, different timelines. Sometimes you can feel things kind of shift a little bit and you don't know if it, if it got better or worse, you know, kind of like the, uh, the time of the red sky versus time of the blue sky, all that kind of stuff, the, uh, the thousand year reign of Christ, things like that. You know, are we living after the tribulation? Or are we living before the tribulation? Are we in the tribulation right now? Has the end already happened? Is the end gonna happen again? If Jesus comes back again, is he gonna be a judge rather than a savior? These are all questions we have to ask ourselves sometimes. And then here's another interesting thing here is we have Loki or Balder bound in ancient Britain from a pre-Christian or transition cross at Kirby Suffin, Westmoreland. Note that Loki who has horned as young ox is bound hand and foot by chains to a rock. So that's the interesting thing is why were they finding things like this in ancient Britain? Because the ancient Britons, now what we would refer to as Britons, um, who were like Neolithic. Okay, so some of this stuff was being brought all the way over from the Middle East, these, these kinds of legends were being brought all the way over to the Middle East to the Isle of Britain, to the, the Anglos, you know, which obviously were the first, um, you know, we, we speak English, you know, it's English, Anglo, and then the Anglos mixed with the Saxons and we got Anglo-Saxons. 
Um, so yeah, there's just, there's a lot of information to go over. And that's why I think it would have to be a dedicated video. I couldn't do it all in a live stream, especially with chat and everything else going on. And have to be broken up into parts. And you know, that, that is something that I may do if I decide to. But I'm not, I'm not going to um, go over every single illustration. I'm just kind of, just kind of picking it apart at random. And I haven't really done a live stream, so this is just a good way to kind of start doing some live streams. Okay, so here we have King Thor, Adam rescuing Eve from the lion and the bull demon, chief of Eden. So that's kind of like, that's, that's another example of a reinterpretation, you know, of paradise, of Eden, of, of Adam and Eve, that kind of thing. And we just, we see that popping up a lot in, in this Eda. And we see a lot of how we have Greek, Roman, Norse, uh, Babylonian, Sumerian, Hittite, all that kind of stuff. And why it's interesting with the Sumerians is because we know that the Sumerians have some of the oldest surviving structures and we're lucky that some of these structures are still standing and that we can study those and all that kind of stuff. And then we have the stargates in ancient Babylonia, which is now Iraq. You know, what some people theorize was an ancient form of Antiquitech. You know, modern technology existing thousands of years ago. And we were sometimes lucky enough to find the remnants of that, like the Baghdad battery, things like that. And then we also, we have a lot of examples of the crossover between the Babylonian, the Sumerian, and the ancient Egyptian, if you're into that kind of stuff. It's just a very interesting book. Like I said, very dense, very, at times, poetic. You know, it does tell a story uh, that I can't get into right now. But it's just, it's a very, very interesting collection of, of tales and how they were handed down and through different cultures and then there's all these different interpretations by the Europeans, by the British, uh, what are called the Anglos now, um, or then. And just also the different tribes of Europe, like the Vistagoths and the Vandals and so on and so forth. And we also, we have a, um, an example here. We have the consecrated stone bowl of Eden as the Holy Grail of King Arthur. The stone bowl fragments bearing the original archaic Sumerian inscription of Thor's great grandson circa 3,247 BC and bearing the trophy and Unearthed below foundations of Central Tower, the oldest sun temple in Mesopotamia, and poured by the Pennsylvania Museum expedition, now in author's possession. So the guy who wrote this book actually has this fragment here in his possession, which is interesting. Um, oh, I got a super chat from Francis O'Mara. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. I uh, really appreciate that. Thanks for tuning in. So that's interesting that the... Uh, that the author of this book actually is in possession of these fragments. So, hmm. Here's a carving here. Hittite soldiers on the march from Hittite bastard relief. Uh, Sorkamesh, circa 2300 BC, now in British Museum. I'm just going to read some of the chats here, just catch up with some of these chats.
Neither is there salvation in any other than Jesus Christ, for there is no other name under the heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't think that this book really disagrees with that. Um, this is just a historical record. And, you know, I think that the person who published this book in 1930, the Christian Book Club, um, I think that they would agree with you about that. So, so there's that. Um, and then Christian B says, if proven, knew about Tartary and the thousand years out along with the accepting nothing was carved out of solid rock. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that um, that's still open to interpretation. I think there's a lot of conflicting information, but once again, I'll keep an open mind about everything. Um, if I didn't quite understand what you said, you can obviously rephrase it. All the stuff they make is Gaia polymer and it doesn't discount all the work because craftsmanship to make the forms mold still is needed. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, obviously we run into questions of, of craftsmanship, especially compared to craftsmanship nowadays. Um, a lot of the stuff would obviously be impossible. Oh, geopolymer. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, th I thought that that's what you meant. Okay, so here's here's a here's a here's a good example. Okay, so here we have Prince Khan, Gon, Gawen, Cain, or Malke, as Saint Michael slain the dragon, Apollyon, or Abel in modern art. All right, that's another thing that we see in the Norse mythology is we see a lot of slaying of dragons. Right, so we have Saint Michael, we have Saint George, we have Saint Patrick, who led the serpents out of Ireland. So we we always see this um, this common theme of good overcoming evil, good being represented by various saints or various warriors, and then evil being represented as serpents. So we could say nowadays if we want to tie it into the old world and resets and all that kind of stuff is those who prevent the resets or at least expose the resets could be looked upon the same way. And then the people that are perpetrating the resets and the artificial cataclysms to usher in resets and as, uh, as an excuse to do a reset are the dragons, it's the evil of the world. Obviously, it wouldn't be too hard to make that connection in modern, you know, representation. And then here we have another example of that. We have Prince Khan or Cain as Horus, son of solar father, Atom or Adam, or Osiris slaying Seth, Seth as the dragon crocodile. From Egyptian bas relief, circa 1000 BC, now in Louvre, Paris. Note the hero wears the sun hawk's head and is mounted. That's the other thing too, is we see a lot of representations of the sun, the solar deity, you know, like the son of man, the son of God, the light being the way, so on and so forth. Light destroying darkness. But it all stems back to, in my opinion, a biblical sense. Like none of the information here technically contradicts the Bible. Oh, the other one that I forgot about too was St. Andrew. So we have Adam, Thor as Andara, St. Andrew, Burr, Gear, Giorde, or George slaying the dragon from Hittite seal of about 2500 BC. Note the X cross on his hat and the red sun cross symbol 
his axe is of Hittite shape as opposed to the Babylonian scimitar. You see, so that's another good example is Thor in Norse mythology. He's always kind of seen as, as fighting with dragons, killing dragons, serpents, things like that. And then we see St. Andrew, St. George, uh, Adam, right? So Adam is Thor, Thor is Adam, St. Andrew, St. George. There's another example of what I'm talking about here. Thor, Andara, Gyr, Gorde, or George, slaying the dragon in Persian sculpture about 600 BC. Note the sun here was called by the Persians by his late Sumerian title of Ara Mazdai, Ormazd, or Sage of the Sun, and his dragon enemy is Arachaman. Right? I know I'm mispronouncing some of these, but I'm doing the best I can. So this is some of the kind of stuff, in my opinion, that's left over. And we see these things. And that's something that we don't necessarily see anymore unless we want to reinterpret what's happening now. And that's kind of part of I guess you could say that was part of the reset was to try to destroy myth, to try to destroy our connection to these events, I guess we could call them. I guess we could call them events like the floods, the mud floods, the aether storms, things of that nature, and just give it all up to science. So, I'm just kind of uh, check on the chats here for a second. Angie Tuesday said, This is awesome. Thank you, Cyrus the Servants and Book of Enoch. Yeah, Book of Enoch is definitely worth looking into too. Um, I should probably think about doing a video about that particular book and as it pertains to research. And then Hoaxing the World says, know that whatever they speak slash draw a picture of, please toss in the trash. Well, yeah, I mean, we have to work with what we have, but I do agree to a certain extent. And I have said from time to time that books are the perfect containers for lies. In other words, you can read a book. Reading a book doesn't make you more intelligent. It doesn't even necessarily make you more knowledgeable or wise if the information is poison. You have to read a book with a certain amount of discernment, with a certain amount of using your own intuition. You can't just read a book that fits with your narrative and then believe everything because what will happen if you don't pay attention to what you're reading is it'll slowly change you and then you'll be more likely to read another book and then that'll slowly change you and that'll yeah you should live off of your experience and your consciousness which is the true voice of god obviously you don't want to read too much too much reading it then you start thinking like the authors so i'll agree with that to a certain extent and as far as the drawings and all that stuff yeah you can't trust every drawing but we have to use what we have so what i'm saying is you have to um, use your own discernment. In other words, are you intelligent enough to take into your mind someone else's opinion and determine if it is good or bad, or if it's useful or unuseful information? Because, um, yeah, an open mind is, you know, it's like an open window. The wind blows in, the wind blows out, all that kind of stuff, yeah. so. We have to just use what we have, but we don't have to believe everything that we read and we don't have to believe everything that we see. Francis Samara says, thank you for all your research, Scary. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Let's kind of catch up on the chat again here.
Michael DeSilva says, The Book of Adam is a delightful book, and I wonder why it's not in Genesis where it belongs. Yeah, that's true. I don't know either. But luckily, we can we can still read those things on our own. Cyrus the Stern says, The ear tries the world like the tongue tries the meat. Folks, and also thanks for paying attention to others. Sean Kessel says you make valid points. Well, thank you. Christian B says, look at the drawings of King Solomon's temple in the upper left. You see the pyramids with the structures around the blocks, the size of the city squares, almost crazy. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of mystery and a lot to learn about Solomon's temple. That's for sure. Um, Shirak Finley says, have they always been able to control weather through the resets? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that that took a lot of time to, to, uh, to control the weather. Um, that's definitely some, some very evil um, technology to be able to do that. I'm not exactly sure when they um, were able to do that. So yeah, I mean, if somebody wants me to research this book a little bit more, maybe do kind of a, a, a standalone video about what the information actually is trying to give the reader, maybe I'll do that and do a special video for that. Um, not exactly what, not exactly sure uh, what more I can really say about this. Um, I'm glad that a lot of people tuned in. I'm not done yet. I'm not leaving yet. I'm just, just kind of thinking a little bit what some of the people are saying in the chat and taking all that into consideration, you know, because it is important to listen to other people's opinions. I mean, that's what this community is about. This is about sharing information. And, uh, so yeah, like I was saying, so here's another example. St. George slaying the dragon from Woodcut and Caxton's Golden Legend. 1493 AD. Reduce have to compare this drawing with that in the minute Sumerian Hittite seal several thousands of years earlier. So yeah, so it's like, exactly. See, so that's another example. Is It's an example of here slaying the dragon. So we have older examples, but those examples came from, from Babylon, Sumeria, you know. And then here we have the Holy Mountain of Eden or Carchemish on the Euphrates from the west. Note that King Adam, Erthor or Arthur's seat is approximately marked here by the cross. So then you get into the legend of Arthur and who was Arthur and all that kind of stuff and Camelot and all that kind of stuff. And that could be like old world reset kind of stuff in the sense that maybe that was real, the age of Camelot, King Arthur, Merlin, being a sorcerer, being some type of, you know, wizard or whatever. And then that information after the after a reset was, I guess you would say relegated, belittled down to just a myth. And we think about some of the things that we've witnessed with our own eyes is that in the future going to be called a myth like oh that didn't happen that was just a myth um so uh hoaxing the world say may i ask where you are and how to send you ten dollars us without jerks getting any taking any of it from you My uh, PayPal is in Ireland. Are you close? No, I'm, I'm in the United States. Um, and I know what you mean about them taking a, a, a percentage of it, but if you wish to donate, um, I, I really do appreciate that. But I don't really know any way around it these days. So, um, you know, you can become a member. That would help a lot. Uh, you can become a member of the channel or you can look me up on Patreon, or you can buy some merch on oldscaryworld.com. 
then it doesn't i don't they don't take too big of a cut um and you get and you get some merch so that would help but it's it's up to you you know anything helps but uh as far as getting around them taking a cut there's really no way around that these days but i i do appreciate the generosity uh regardless And then another thing too that I found while I was going through this book here is we have the serpent transfixed on the sun cross. Um, and then that word, you know, I don't know about that word on YouTube. So I'm just going to kind of gloss over that. Oh, the resurrecting sun, an ancient Britain monument. So we know, we know about the serpent and the staff and the medical symbol and all that kind of stuff. And if you don't, well, you can look that up, but there's a whole history with that and the staff of Hermes and, all that and, you know and then here we have um the reform set abel seth balder the second the wolf chief assisting the sun hot goth and balancing the judgments from the egyptian steel so with that you know in ancient egyptian uh belief is that when you die is that your heart is weighed with a feather and if your heart weighs more than the feather, which is the heart is where you, you carry all of your, your sin and your guilt and all your negative emotions in your heart. So if your heart is heavier than the feather, then you go down into the underworld. And if your heart is lighter than the feather or equal, then you go to their heaven or their paradise, if you will. So I'm just gonna check the chats really quick. Christian B says, scary, you got a great aura. I'm drawn into your video and appreciate them and you positive energy coming to all of you. Well, thank you very much, Christian B. I do appreciate that comment. Um, life can be pretty stressful sometimes, so it's nice to know that somebody's thinking positive vibes. Um, I do appreciate that, thank you. And then here we have a depiction of the idolized three beards of fate on top of the Gothic Eve by Greek Voltaires of Mother Goddess, fifth century BC, after Collington, compared with the primitive and more authentic portraits in figure one and early seals. Yeah, so you'd have to go back and look through that. But then um, another illustration here is we have Adam Thor's handled sun cross symbol of the universal victory of life and of life born aloft from Hittite seal circa 1400 BC. Note the two rays of light issue from the cross. So it's, yes, yeah, so the Ankh, you know, symbol of eternal life. And then we have like the Christian cross and that's a symbol of eternal life through the salvation of Christ. So you, you start to see the similarities, you know, between the two and, and how, um, it's not to say that one borrowed or one stole. It's to say that it's a universal. This is the way that I like to look at it, is that they weren't stealing their symbols. They weren't stealing their stories. The reason that they keep popping up is because it's the truth. It's the universal truth. That's why it keeps reappearing in different cultures and different civilizations throughout time and time again. That's, that's my understanding is why do the same stories keep popping up? Why do the same rules, why do the same commandments, why do the same morals and ethics? Because it's a universal truth and the universal truth can never be erased from the realm. Lies need to be defended. The truth doesn't need to be defended. You stop telling a lie, it'll disappear. If someone stops telling the truth, it doesn't make the truth go away. You dig? It's like, Lies need to be defended. The truth needs to be represented. That's the difference between a truth and a lie. It's like the difference between a hero and the opposite of a hero. What's the opposite of a hero? 
if anybody knows, they can say in the chat, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give it a minute if anybody wants to say or anybody wants to guess what the opposite of a hero is. Does anybody know or anybody want to guess or say a villain? No. You know, you'd think it's a villain, right? But no, see, a villain is a hero to some. Plus, at least a villain, like, acts. No, the opposite of a hero is a coward. No one likes a coward. That's why a coward is the opposite of a hero, because cowards don't do anything. See, a villain is a hero to some. A hero to some is a villain to others. But a coward? A coward nobody respects. Because cowards don't do anything. They don't act at all. At least a villain acts. At least a villain has some type of, of message or some type of purpose or some type of plan. And also, those are subjective terms because, you know, like I said, you know, a villain to some is a hero to others. But a coward, a coward is a person who does nothing. So a coward is like, he's the, he's the complete lowest of the low. He's, he's the lowest on the totem pole. And then, so now we're at the appendices. So, I mean, there's no more illustrations and we're coming up on a little over an hour. And, you know, uh, this, this uh, live stream went pretty well and I'd like to do more so I think uh, next time I do a live stream, it'll be a different book. I'll go through my uh, book collection and I'll try to find a, uh, another book to go through. Um, I have this one here, but uh, I don't think that this one's, um, this one's probably not a good one to go on, uh, on YouTube. But if you guys want to look up this one, this is a good one too. But uh, some of the stuff in here I don't think I want to talk about on YouTube. But um, maybe I'll do a members-only video for this one. But uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the uh, deep dive on the British Ida by L.A. Waddell. And if anybody's interested um, in this edition, this is the edition that was put out by the Christian Book Club. Hawthorne, California, 1930. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for the super chats. Thanks for the good points, the valid points. And um, yeah, I'll catch you on the next live stream. And as always, if you haven't already, please subscribe. And you can also find me on Instagram at Mudflood Memes or Old Scary World. And if you wish to support my research, you can become a member of the channel or you can purchase some merchandise at oldscaryworld.com. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.